This is a Faith Defenders audio podcast. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7 as we begin our study in this epistle. Romans chapter 7. We had noticed in our last discussion that the Apostle Paul was being autobiographical when he spoke concerning his conversion. Starting in verse 7, he said, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. That is, I really thought I was a fine fellow. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrew. I had the right pedigree, the right family connections. I was very moral and religiously strict. I was a Pharisee. I was honored. I had studied under the greatest of teachers, the Gamaliel and other situations that made him very proud of his life. And yet, he did not understand that he was a sinner. Well, here the Apostle Paul states the way he came to understand that he was a sinner was through the law. For he goes on to say, I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And here he speaks about self-revelation, that when he compared himself to God's law, he discovered that he was falling short, that he was a sinner, And particularly the sin of coveting was that particular commandment that got him. There's always that particular commandment that gets us. It may be the one about lying. It may be the one about stealing. It may be the one about immorality. It may be this one or it may be that one. In Paul's life, it was the sin of coveting. Uh, He coveted or was jealous of the position and material possessions and perhaps the wife or whatever it was of those around him and he finally came to understand he was a sinner through the law. Therefore he concludes in verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So he's speaking autobiographical. He uses the past tense about once this was true of him, but it is no longer true. He came to discover this or that about himself. And then we notice a dramatic change in the tense in the passage when you come to verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. It is spiritual in the sense of of the Holy Spirit. It is also spiritual in the sense of pertaining to the inner spirit within man and not simply having to do with outward conformity. Remember, the Pharisees had the problem that they thought that they could uh, meditate on adultery all they wanted, uh, but as long as they didn't go do it, everything was fine. And Jesus said, no, there is the spirituality of the law that touches the heart as well as the actions. But you will notice that he says, the law is spiritual, but I... And then what's the next verb? Was? Or is it the word am? Now we have a dramatic break in terms of the grammar of the text. The Apostle Paul is still being autobiographical, but instead of discussing his conversion experience, when he came to know Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, he now talks about his present condition in the Christian life. Now, it is often the case that with Arminian, Keswick, higher lifer, deeper lifer, some of our charismatic friends, that they fail to observe the grammar of this text and they continue 
their interpretation as if the Apostle Paul was speaking only about his unconverted state. So that the Apostle Paul, from verses 14 through 25, is continuing his description of the unregenerate man who comes to know sin through the law. But I think this is erroneous because of the change in the verb which is so dramatic and has been pointed out by many commentators. Or there are those who look at this passage and say, well, here the Apostle Paul is once again talking about the past, but he's talking about the defeated Christian life when Paul was a carnal Christian. So I've heard sermons on this passage in which they talk about the carnal Paul, because as you notice, verse 14, I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. But if you read the King James, it says, I am carnal, sold unto sin. And they say, well, this refers to Paul's experience at some point in his life when he was a carnal Christian. And then he entered into victory in chapter 8. Or particularly, they like verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And they said, now it was that point, you see, that he entered into victorious living and he no longer had a struggle with sin. Well, both of these interpretations, I think, do not fit the context. They do not fit the grammar. Those who believe that the Apostle Paul is still discussing what it was to be an unregenerate person take the view of Pelagius. Pelagius was a monk in the early church that was condemned as a heretic. Augustine fought against him in Augustine I. Pelagius taught there was no such thing as original sin. We are all born sinless and innocent and perfect, just like Adam and Eve were created. And each of us is given our own opportunity to choose whether to sin or whether to obey God. And that's how he would argue that even though you are unregenerate, these things could be said of you. Verse 22, I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Does that really sound like the unregenerate person who's rejoicing in the law of God? Well, I remember when I was unregenerate, I didn't rejoice in the law of God. Did any of you rejoice in the law of God when it told you you couldn't do all the naughty things you wanted to do? Is the world out there saying hallelujah for the Ten Commandments? Let's put them on the walls of every school in the country. No, they're doing everything to get away from the laws of God. And the unregenerate does not understand. It, he does not seek after God. And there is no fear of God before his eyes. Is it true that the unregenerate wants to do what is good and then struggles with the reality? No, usually it's the other way around. They want to do evil and they find difficulty doing it because their conscience bothers them. No, the Pelagian interpretation is not the proper one. The Keswick or higher life interpretation that it is the carnal Christian life is based upon the assumption that when you have arrived in the Christian life, you no longer have a struggle with sin. Now, in this congregation, you've never heard that idea or doctrine preached from the pulpit. But in the first eight years of my Christian experience, I was in a church which every year had the Keswick meeting in which various speakers would come and preach the victorious life, sinless perfectionism, that it was possible to enter a stage in the Christian life in which you no longer struggled with sin. Temptation rolled off your back like water off a duck's back. No longer would you have any struggle with temptation. Sin had no allurement or attraction to you. You were capable of saying no in such a strong way that you could go for days, weeks, months, and even years without committing even one sin. This view of the Christian life, the victorious life, the sinless life, was presented 
And sometimes they would choose this passage to talk about those of you in the congregation who are struggling with sin in the carnal Christian experience as Paul describes in Romans 7, 14 through 25. But we have great news that Jesus Christ can enable you to enter into the victory and then you will be set free from the body of this death. And then you enter into the experience of Romans 8 which is one of victory instead of defeat. Well, I'm sad to tell you that that's a pipe dream, that that doesn't work. All the times I ran down the aisle, I let go and I let God. I did the no, wreck, and yield, obey method. I did the Allen Redpath. I did the Stuart Briscoe. I did the Stephen Olford. I did the Major Ian Thomas. I tried them all. Matter of fact, my first year in college, at 18 years of age, I ended up with bleeding ulcers and over half of my blood was gone and I almost died because I was determined to arrive at that state in the Christian life where I was sinless because I wanted to be holy and I was told that's the way to go about it. Well, lo and behold, as you read the scriptures, you will find out that this is not indeed what the Bible holds out. The Bible is utterly realistic. It paints people just as they are. This is what gives me hope. If the Bible were the product of man's ingenu ingenuity, the Bible would not record the sins of the saints. I've had Muslims tell me, well, the Bible can't be true because your Bible talks about how that Abraham sinned and lied and David was an immoral man, whereas we know that if these men were truly prophets, they were sinless. That's how they claimed that Muhammad was sinless. And how can the Bible be true if it contains the sins of these people? And I turn it around and I said, no, it's the other way around. The Quran is not true because it wasn't honest. These people were sinners. There's none that sin not. Matter of fact, for all have sinned and are right now falling short of the glory of God. So the Quran is false because it didn't record the sins of these people. Let's begin by reading verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold into bondage to sin. For that which I am doing, I do not understand. So let's begin there. In your own Christian experience, as you look in the mirror and you begin to have pangs of conscience because you know you're not sinless. You yell at your wife, you yell at your husband, you yell at your kids. You get angry, you lose your temper at work, you get greedy and covetous. You tell those little white lies that you shouldn't be telling. You say things that you shouldn't say, you do things you shouldn't do. If you look in the mirror, you'll have to say, I'm still carnal. I may be a dedicated Christian, I may be trying to live for the Lord, but in the end, I know I'm still carnal. Because when I look at my life, there's a lot about me that isn't spiritual. And, it, and it's interesting to note that J.C. Ryle in his book on holiness has a section where he quotes the greatest of the people of God. I mean the great saints, the men and women we look up to as being great men of God. Well, the greater they were, the lower the view they had of themselves and they all said, I'm carnal. The deeper you go in the Christian life, the deeper you understand your sin the more you realize how you need Jesus, the more you realize you're wretched and wicked. The more spiritual you are, the more unspiritual you view yourself. The more godly you become, the more ungodliness you will see in your life. So the most mature Christian is the one who senses his immaturity the greatest. Not the Christian who runs around and says, I'm sinless and haven't sinned for 15 years. That's a shallow Christian. Or someone says, hey, I'm great in the Christian life. I'm okay. Well, that's a very spiritual uh, thing to say, isn't it? No, it isn't. Here, Apostle Paul said, I am carnal, and sometimes I feel in bondage to sin. Have you ever felt that way? Well, yes, you should have, because there are habits, bad habits, besetting sins, and you haven't been able to break the chains. For that which I am doing, I don't understand. Have you ever thought about that? You really don't understand yourself. 
I've thought about that at times. I said, Maura, you are stupid. Why did you do that? Why did you? That's utterly stupid. It's not only evil, it's stupid. Why? It, it, did it do any good for you? Not really. Did it do any good for your wife and your kids? No. Did it help your church? No. Help anybody on to God? Did, it do, did he have any benefit whatsoever? No, but I did it anyway. And in this Apostle Paul says, sometimes I don't understand. Why, why do I do what I do? He said, listen, I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. Am I the only one who ever feels that struggle of knowing what should be done and then not doing it? I know I'm supposed to give my wife a minimum of three hugs a day. I've been trying to be so good. I'd say, this is one. Then later on, I give her number two. I, know I shouldn't be counting, but I'm so busy and preoccupied with my work, I, I realize that I neglect my family. And I know I shouldn't be doing that. I should be paying attention to their needs. I'm just thinking of the next book I got to write. And I'm mulling over the problem of evil. There I am tramping around and my son's upset and I don't even know it. Well, you see, this is where what you're doing you don't want to do and what you want to do you don't do. Isn't it amazing that we know what to do but then we don't do it? And we know what not to do and we determine not to do it and we still do it. This is the conundrum, you see, that the Apostle Paul was puzzled by. Verse 16, for if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. The law is good because it points out sin in my life. Shouldn't have those kinds of thoughts. Shouldn't be doing that. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Say, so, well, can't you reach that point in the Christian life where you can smile and say, a lot of good dwells in me? Well, I hope not. The moment you think you can put your head on the pillow and say, oh, I don't have to ask for forgiveness because I'm okay. I don't need the blood of Jesus today. I, I did a, a good, I have a lot of good in my life. That's the moment either you've apostatized from the Christian life or you are terribly deluded, terribly deluded. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells within me. Now, he's going to use a personification. It is a literary device in which he's going to speak about this bundle of energy, drive, and habits that motivates him to do things against his own conscience. And he's going to personify it and talk about sin as if there's another person inside of it a split personality. And he's talking about sin in a figurative way. He is not literally saying there are two Pauls. Now, you again, see some of the Arminian folk read this passage and make literal what was meant to be metaphorical. And they'll say, well, you see, there's really two natures. There's two yous. There's a good you and there's a bad you. There's the good dog and the ba bad dog, the black dog and the white dog. And they're both in cages. And you sit, with, you sit there and you have levers. And when you pull the right-handed lever, the white dog runs out and does good. And goes to church and prays with the family and does all of those things. But when you pull the other level, the black dog runs out. And the white dog goes back in the cage. And the black dog does all the evil things. And then you sit there in your whole life pulling these levers, letting these dogs out. And then the higher life people in their illustration said, now... Which dog is the strongest? And I'll never get one preacher said, which em dog you feed em most? And he tried to make this into an American Indian illustration. Which em dog you feed em most is the dog that's the strongest. So if you feed the sinful nature, then you'll give in to sin. And if you feed the good nature, you'll give in to righteousness. So don't watch those bad movies and those bad TV programs and don't read bad books and talk with bad people and 
don't drink and dance and smoke and chew and this and this and this. Instead, you've got to do the good things and you'll feed that doll. Well, here he's using a metaphor. He said, listen, I have a struggle. It's as if I'm a split personality. Half of me wants to do what is right and the other half wants to do what is wrong. So when my wife got out of hand, half of me said, a soft answer turns away wrath. Love her, understand her. It's that time of the month. She can't be held responsible. The other half says, well, I can't repeat what the other half might say and might tell her where she ought to go and might say some very unkind things. And you find the struggle within yourself of trying to say exactly what are you going to do? This is what he's talking about. He said, there's a struggle. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the wishing is present in me. The willing, the wishing, the desire is present. But the doing, the doing is what? The doing of the good is not present. He says, I have a desire to do what is right, but when I try to carry it out, I find myself doing the opposite. Have you ever really tried to answer with a soft answer and end up yelling? If you've ever had children, you know the experience. You say, well, I'm going to be patient now. My teenage son did not clean his room, and we gave him one day, we gave him two days. We've given him an extension. And I'm just going to be very nice and sit him down on the corner of the bed and say, now, honey, we've got to deal with this. And you walk in that room and you're all intending to be very nice and sweet. And as you walk in, something happens and you start yelling. And you get angry and you get blistering and you didn't intend to. There was no conscious choice saying, I am now going to be angry. The choice was, I'm going to speak quietly and calmly to my son and then when you get there, you started yelling. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about an inner struggle, a conflict. Verse 19, for the good that I wish to do, I don't do. But I end up practicing the very evil I don't want to do. Do you see the difference between the I want to's and what you end up doing? This is how you know if you're truly a Christian. An unregenerate person doesn't even have the I want to. They never think about it. They never say, oh, that I could be godly. Oh, that I might be holy. Oh, that I might love the Lord more. Oh, Father, oh, that I might read your word more, that I might pray more. It's a Christian who's guilty about not praying enough. It's the Christian who feels guilty because, you know, he or she is not being kind enough. An unregenerate person doesn't think that way. And this is what Christians don't understand. Unregenerate people at work are not worrying about the sin of gossip. They just gossip. Never, never crosses their mind not to do office gossip. They just gossip. Or be angry or be mean. They don't think about it for one moment. It doesn't bother them to be mean. Or to lie. Whew, doesn't bother them to lie at all. They'll lie left and right at work. Oh, I did that. I finished it. They know they didn't. There's no pang of conscience. Doesn't bother them in the least. Here we have a child of God wrestling with sin, struggling with iniquity because he doesn't want it. Do you see that the child of God does not want sin? But he ends up doing it. And he's doing what he doesn't want to do. But notice on which side the want to's are. See that? It's the child of God saying, Lord, I don't want to, but I end up doing it. This is why he says in verse 19, for the good that I wish I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not wish, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. He says, there's a set of me, a set of habits and desires that, within me that I can't seem to control. Well, you see, when you are born again, God puts new desires in your heart. You hunger and thirst after righteousness. You want to love the Lord. You want to live a godly life. You, you really want to have family devotion. You want to pray with your children every night. You must pray with your children every night. You know you should pray with your children every night. 
That's what means you're a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you never think about it. You turn off the light and go to bed and it never crosses your mind. Why? There's no want to. And you see, that's how you know if you're saved or not. If there's no struggle with sin, it's because you're dead in sin. Do dead people struggle? Ever been to a, a morgue and see them fighting and wrestling there in those little refrigerated boxes? Look like big filing cabinets. No, if you're dead, your struggling's over. If you're dead in sin, you're not struggling. If you are struggling with sin, it's because you are alive and you're a child of God and you hate it. I find then, verse 21, the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. If you are a child of God, you know this problem. You want to do what is right, and you know what is right because you have the law of God. The, the willing is there, but you can't seem to pull it off. Verse 22, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Only a regenerate person can say that. Only a regenerate person. Unbelievers do not concur with the law of God in the inner man. They're not secretly, inwardly for it. They're rebellious against God. They don't want it. Go out in the street and grab the nearest pagan. Do you want the law of God? Do you desire to conform yourself to the Ten Commandments? He's probably shacked up with some woman, not even married. He doesn't want it. The child of God says not only does he concur for it, but joyfully agree with it. That's a child of God. But I see a different law. Remember the law of God, now the law of sin, in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Do you see there are two sets of drives, one for good and one for evil, and they're struggling and you're fighting and you're trying desperately to do what's right, but you end up doing wrong. Verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? And if you remember the illustration that I gave several times, this speaks of the fact that in Roman society, one of the punishments for murder was to literally bind the body of your murder victim to your body, arm to arm, leg to leg, so as that body rotted and it would be strapped onto your back. It would rot into your flesh and you, the one you killed would kill you in the end as the worms got you. It was a horrible, horrible punishment. And this is the illustration that he uses from the Greek. He said, who shall deliver me from this deadly body of sin that's strapped to my body that's a rotting, stinking corpse? Who's going to deliver me from this situation? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, of course... In the Keswick or Higher Life teaching, I've heard them always stop at that point and say, yes, here the Apostle Paul says, it's possible to be delivered from the struggle with sin. How do you do it? Come down the altar now. Give your all on the altar to Jesus. Just rest. Resting in the joy of what thou art. Jesus, I am resting. Or no wreck and yield or bay or... Or there's, all, there's a ten-step plan or the five-step plan or just come down to the altar, it's total commitment or whatever it is. The trouble is they don't keep reading. So then, verse 25, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. If you said, Bob Morey, do you know the right way to treat your wife and your kids? Yes, I have to admit I do. Do you know how to live right? Yes. That's great. In your mind, do you agree with that? Yes, I agree that the law is holy and righteous and true and I know what I should do in life and how I should treat people and how I should uh, carry myself and what I should do. But, notice that little word, but. You ought to circle that in your Bible because we always love those word buts. But, on the other hand, with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. 
It's an ellipsis in the Greek. He didn't have to repeat the words, I am serving. He had already said it. Thus, in terms of Greek grammar, he says, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, I myself with my flesh am serving the law of sin. The Apostle Paul throws you right back into the struggle at the end of verse 25. Well, then where does the victory come? What about this thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord? Yeah, there will be victory at death. When you die, the body of sin will be cut off of you and you will arise, and if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, and what will happen to you? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to what? The spirits of justified men and women now made perfect. That's what the Greek says. It says justified, they were declared righteous on earth and they're made righteous in heaven. They had imputed perfection on earth and now they have constitutional perfection in heaven. The spirit is perfected in the presence of the king when you die and go to heaven. Well, what about the body? Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And I've heard sermons on entire sanctification. Holiness, entire sanctification. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the altar. Is that what it says? At the camp meeting at the invitation system, at the invitation, when you speak in tongues, you can list all these things there, when you let go and let God, when do you receive entire sanctification? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he returns, will your body be totally sanctified? Yes. What does that mean? Turn over to Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. The Greek says simply, uh, who will transform our humble or humiliated body into a glorious body. We're going to be transformed when Jesus returns so that our fleshly body will no longer be in a state of humiliation but in a state of glorification. So when is it that we receive this victory? Well, you get half of it when you die. <laughs> you say, oh, pastor, you mean there's no hope I can be sinless in this life? Right? Absolutely, there's no hope. Do you mean I'm always going to have to struggle with sin? Yes, you're always going to have to struggle with sin. But does that mean that I should just give in to it? No, you are supposed to struggle. Isn't that the word? Struggle with sin. Don't give in to the evil motivations and drives. Don't yell and say those things you should not say. Don't give in to the impulses to immorality, to wickedness, and to all the evil that simply floats around in your system. Instead, you are to take the attitude of the Apostle Paul where he was struggling against sin. Can't you see this back in chapter 7 of Romans? I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. I'm going to conform myself to what God wants and repent 
But what happens, Paul, when even though you, you've tried and you've prayed and you really wanted to love your wife the way you should, and you still yell at her, you repent of it, you pick up the pieces and you say, the law of God is good, I was the one that was wrong, I sinned, and Lord, I ask you to help me that the next time I'm tempted to yell at my wife, I won't yell. One of my old professors who has since contacted me, Mr. George Hutchinson, probably does not remember what he said in one of his les lessons when I was a freshman in college, but he said this, emphasize in your Christian life the many occasions when you were tempted to do evil and you didn't do it. More than emphasizing the times you gave in. If you dwell simply on the occasions in which you gave in to evil and you sinned, you will end up in a morbid, sad, depressed Christian life. The wonder of the Christian life is not that you give in to sin. Any old unregenerate can do that. The amazement is when you don't. So what you have to do is emphasize in your own life and meditate and relect. You know, I was tempted to think those dirty thoughts and I said, Lord Jesus, help me, and you didn't think them. Or you got up and turned the television off when too much flesh was being exposed. I'm thankful for remote control. Watching a movie and all of a sudden you see something, man, you get the remote and turn that channel real quick. Why? Because there's no reason to tempt yourself. Well, I'm strong enough in the crib. Ah! All of us have a tender box in the soul, just waiting for those sparks to fly, just blaze up in sin. So when you don't give in and you don't yell at your kids and you're actually able to go in and sit down and say, you've got to clean your room, then you should thank the Lord that he enabled you to do that. That was of his mercies. If you do you will take an upbeat view of the Christian life instead of a downbeat. You can be more optimistic than pessimistic. You can be a happy Christian. You mean you can still be a happy Christian? Yes, you can be happy. See the word joy found over in verse 22? Still there in the midst of the struggle. Why? Because I may be down, but I'm not out. I may lose this battle, but I'm not going to lose the war. Yes, you may sin at this particular point by giving in to evil, but that doesn't mean you're going to give in to evil tomorrow and commit that same sin. You'll do some other kind of sin that day. Don't have to worry. There's always many different kinds of evils. If it's not one thing, it's another, said Hosean on Saturday Night Live. And that's true. If it's not one thing, it's another. Thanks be to God that when Jesus returns, we will be delivered from our struggle with sin. But folks, not till then. So I'm not giving you any pipe dreams, no, no bowls of cherry and no uh, gardens. I'm giving you reality. There is a struggle with sin if you're truly saved. If you're this, here this morning and there's no struggle, you're not saved. If there's a struggle, at least there's life. And in one respect, that old Indian proverb was true, which and one you feed him most, him be strongest. You've got to read the Word every day. You've got to pray every day. You've got to pray with your family. You've got to go to church. You've got to be with God's people. As you feed the righteous desires, you will find them getting stronger. If you feed the evil, they will be getting stronger. That's true. And I'll leave you with Galatians 6, where Paul says, God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we sow to the flesh, we shall reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we shall reap eternal life. Sow to the Spirit. Do those things which encourage your spiritual life. For more resources to earnestly contend for the faith, visit faithdefenders.com.